if our families have any hope, people must know Jesus. This is what we must experience. The time is coming on this earth where you will have to stand. Days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us the warning is given. Take heed to yourself. Father in heaven, it is such a blessing to be able to just have moments where we can bow in your presence and recognize that our Savior is actually taking our prayers from the lips of the Holy Spirit and presenting them to you in our behalf. And we're thankful that Jesus has so identified with us tonight that even when he presents our prayers and you hear his voice, you see us standing there before your throne. We pray that you would please forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our lack of gratitude and appreciation. And deepen our love and respect and honor for Jesus and what he has done for us. We long to one day meet with you where we can look at you face to face. But until then, tonight we ask that the Holy Spirit's presence would so occupy this room and our minds and our thoughts and allow us to understand your word and what it is that we believe from your word. Please, dear God, bless your children. There are so many things that we could be doing, but tonight we've come to worship and to learn from you. Thank you. Pray for the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. Breathe on us, dear God. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for not turning a deaf ear on us. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, I pray that if you have not read any of your handouts, that you'll make sure that you study this particular one. I've given this out before, and I really think that this particular handout is a handout that points to personal responsibility. The Lord is hand-picking a peculiar army and I think that many of us 
take too lightly the power of our influence. Now, I just want to read one thing before we go into our scriptures this evening. Notice on your handout, the second paragraph in particular. I often refer to this, but I just really would like for you to really be prayerful as you consider this and even as you study this on your own. It says, every soul is surrounded by an atmosphere of its own. An atmosphere, it may be charged with the life-giving power of faith, courage and hope, and sweet with the fragrance of love. Or it may be heavy and chill with the gloom of discontent and selfishness or poison poisonous with the deadly taint of cherished sin. By the atmosphere surrounding us, every person with whom we come in contact is consciously or what? Unconsciously affected. This is a responsibility from which we cannot free ourselves. Our words, our acts, our dress, our deportment, even the expression of the continents has an influence. And the reason why the Lord impressed upon me to give this out again tonight is because I really think that many of us take lightly the unseen spiritual war that is going on. And so often, now, ladies, ladies, come on. Amen. Come on, ladies. Come on. Let's, ladies, I need you to stop talking now. You know, I can't tell you mean because you could be my mother, but please, you have to be respectful in the sanctuary. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the warfare that we are in, Satan is playing for keeps. He knows that he has a short time. His whole purpose is to get us trapped in sin and hopefully do one or two things. If he cannot kill us in our sins, then he wants to use us. He has no good desires for us at all, but he wants to use us to pull as many down as he possibly can. And unfortunately, too often the professed children of God are guilty of being used to draw people into the ranks of Satan rather into the arms of God. And one of the most powerful points that was made here is it says unconsciously or consciously we have an impact on anyone we go around. The devil is a hitchhiker. Demons need some human to use so that they could draw other humans. Sheep attract sheep. God wants that influence to be used for him. And I pray that you would ask God as you study and read over this particular handout, how is my influence being used? Do I walk around sometimes gloomy and stressed out? Do you know when we get to heaven, those who are lost, who have committed sins, every sin will come under the headline of selfishness. Every sin will come under the headline of selfishness. Selfishness. And when you are in gloom and depressed and discouraged and you carry yourself like that and you profess to know God, you are not professing to serve the true God. Never did Jesus have gloom on his face. Even in his most difficult hours, you still saw upon him a stamp of peace, a stamp of assurity, a stamp of confidence, but it wasn't his own, it was his father's. For had he ever surrendered to the flesh, then Christ would have been stressed out completely. Our little troubles and difficulties and problems 
that we experience. Can you imagine having the weight of the whole world's sins laid on you? And you have to carry every single one of them. Brothers and sisters, I'm so grateful that first of all, we don't have the capacity to imagine such a thing because to even imagine such a thing would crush the life out of us. To even be able to imagine completely what Christ has gone through would literally crush our life. But he did it. And he did it with joy. He didn't do it complaining. He didn't do it murmuring. He did it because he expects the fulfillment of his original intent. And what is that? That we might have eternal life with him. That God might give us back the garden that he created for us. Jesus is a wonderful gift giver. Can you imagine the father giving his son, Adam, a world as a birthday gift? Here, Adam, this is your world. Everything in it will be under your dominion. But wait a minute, Adam. I'm going to create a special little house. I'm the architect and the builder of this home. This is yours. All I ask you to do is love me. All I ask you to do is love me. And listen, Adam, in that love comes trust. Trust and belief. Now, the minute you stop trusting me, I'm going to know it. Why? Because you have to just believe me at my word. That tree over there, leave it alone. Come here with me. It's safe now. You're with me. I want to bring you close to it. Now, look at it. It looks good. Everything about it seems okay. Even the elements and nutrients in the fruit appear to be greater and more superior than all these other trees. But look, son, take me at my word. Leave this one alone, okay? Yes, Father. Come here, let me hug you. Can you imagine without sin, Adam created in the very image of God? Come here, let me hug you. And Jesus putting his arms around Adam and hugging him and then saying, take a nap, son. And he causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam, deep representing a long sleep. And then he makes an incision with his finger and brings one of his ribs out. Can you imagine the expression on the face of all the created beings, angels all beholding the earth, a spectacle to the world? Even the Bible says we are a spectacle to the world right now. It says angels are watching us. We're written epistles, known and read of all men. And this is why our influence is so important. Can you imagine? Angels had no idea what, were, what was going on. The first time they ever saw blood was when Jesus made the incision in the side of Adam. And none of it dripped. It was all kept safely around that one bone. And then he made Eve. Adam still sleep. And he took Eve and said, come here, honey. My precious daughter, look at you. You're beautiful. See this? I need you to leave this tree alone. Why is it so hard to believe that when God says something's not good for us? Why is it so hard to believe that when God says we need to leave something alone, that God is withholding something from us? No matter how much he gives us. I mean, can you imagine? He, he, he explicitly directed and taught Eve about loyalty. And then after the instruction, then he said, come Eve, now that we're together. Come here, let me hug you. Gave her a hug. And then he awakened Adam and said, Eve, look to your right. Can you imagine? Think about it. And Eve looks to her right. And God says, Eve. Adam, come together, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Everything that you see belongs to you. And then God said, wait a minute now, there's one other thing I need to tell you about. Watch this, watch this. And all of a sudden, God creates another day. And the day was called the Sabbath. And he said, now look, everything else I created for you. This, everything else is created for you. This is created for you to worship me. So you go on and have a good time. You work, enjoy the garden. And once a week, I've created a day 
that the only thing we'll do is me and you will spend the whole day together. Can you imagine how happy they were to be able to spend the whole day with God? But they didn't trust God. They didn't trust God, and as a result and a lack of trust, today, rather than having an influence that is so pure and so likable and so loving that lions would run up to you and want to just play with you, rather than having an influence where every file of the air would land on your hand and you'd be able to dispatch it and play with birds, rather than having an influence where you can call and command the sea urchins to come and to do whatever you want, they became afraid of you. And why did they fear you? Because they knew that as animals without the ability to reason, they respect and do what the Creator says without question. Do you know there's not a dog in the world that won't bark if the Savior says bark? Even a donkey believed that he could speak English when God told the donkey to rebuke Balaam. Donkey didn't question it, just turned and rebuked him in the name of Jesus. And animals saw when man rebelled that man was something to be feared. Anybody who could reject all this and not trust a God like that, I'm going to be afraid of. I wish we could look into the mind of animals and wonder why they behave the way they behave, why a snake would lash out and bite you. That wasn't always that way. Because we didn't trust God, we changed the whole environment. And now we have an influence that can be for good or for evil. And you can hide it from people, but you can't hide it from the demons. And it's not about our, our power to persuade people and think that people think or, 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 or cause people to think highly of us. It's the power of the unseen that we should be concerned about. When I travel on this path today, am I really subconsciously influencing people to do that which is holy? Or am I breeding the earth and strengthening the world with darkness? We must pray about that. And we must ask God to help us to check ourselves because we are not living to ourselves. We're in a spiritual war. Now we have help. We can't lose. Why? Because Jesus personally promised that he would always be with us. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew, what chapter are we going to? I just wish, and I pray, and sometimes as I read the Bible, I try to imagine what it was that caused Adam and Eve to be so foolish. And why do I want to see it? Because genetically, I received that same thing. The Bible says in the book of Gen uh, 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 Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28, Beginning with verse 19. Go ye therefore, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want to thank you for Jesus Christ our brother and our Savior. And I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit tonight. Not so that we can speak in any unknown tongue but so that our minds can be clear to the understanding of your righteousness and your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, what, brothers and sisters? All things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of what? The world. Amen. Jesus has promised that if we would live a life with the purpose to teach others about his principles, with the purpose to teach others how to be free, that he will be with us always. Now, how does he do this? How is it that we can't fail? He does this in collaboration and cooperation with the Father, His Father, and with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, a lot of times when people think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they become confused as to how these three can really be one. As a matter of fact, some people believe that when you say the name Allah, it embraces the Father and the Holy Spirit, but not the Son. The war is never against the Holy Spirit or the Father. The war is always to cancel out or diminish the power and authority of Jesus himself. Even the Jehovah's Witness, as faithful as many of them are, in knocking on doors and trying their best to share what they believe to be truth. And some with all their hearts and with all their skills, they, they, they consistently and persistently try to introduce what they believe to people to be the truth. They knocked me out of their belief system the minute they showed me that they didn't believe that Jesus had the authority and the rights and privileges and the power equal to that of God himself. When I read in their Bible where it said in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was a God, not God. I said, no, any religion that diminishes the authority of my Savior is a religion I don't want to have anything to do with. I have dear Muslim friends, respectful Muslim friends, but I never let them even come close to telling me that Allah is the same God that I believe in. Why? Because Jesus Christ, is His role and His power and authority is diminished with the very name Allah. They say, oh, Jesus was a good man. He was a powerful man. He did many wonderful acts by the authority of Allah. But they say that so was the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so was Abraham. And they put them all on the same scale. And, and they will actually tell you, we believe in Jesus too. No, you don't believe in the Jesus I believe in. Because the Jesus I believe in is God who decided to become man. Not to destroy his godliness because godliness is immortal. It cannot die. What he did is suppress the authority of his godliness. What he did is humbled himself in a way that we have not yet learned to humble ourselves. And he gave up all his rights to the glories of heaven and all his rights to command the armies of heaven. And he took on a body, not even a big, strong, good-looking body. He took on a feeble body in order to show that sin could be conquered in the flesh by the authority of a surrendered life and the power of his Father. So don't try to tell me that the Jesus you believe in is the one that I believe in. But the Jesus that I believe in was not ashamed to know that he was indeed equal to God the Father, equal to the Holy Ghost. Now you say, wait a minute. Well, how is it then that these three can be one? That's strange math. That's strange arithmetic. Any school that you go to, whether it be private, whether it be public, whether it be homeschool, will tell you that one plus two equals three. God says, no, 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 no. One plus two equals one in God's book. You say, but how? How is it? It just doesn't seem to make sense. How can the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, even in this text that we just read, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, not names. Look in your Bible for a moment. Notice what it says there, in the name, singular. Notice, listen to what it says. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, not in the names, plural, in the name. Even in the Greek, that word name is singular. In the name of the Father, the Son, and who else? The Holy Ghost. Notice, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, it's clear when we look in the Bible that Jesus claims the oneness with the Father and the oneness with the Holy Spirit. And again, remember, the attack is all about Jesus. 
Everything that you're going to learn as you come to these meetings, you're going to find that every time there's a problem, it's a problem because of Jesus. Last night, we talked about the validity and the power of God's Ten Commandments and why they will stand forever and ever. And we said the reason why the devil hates them so much is because the same way the Ten Commandments are described in the Bible is the way that the character of Jesus is described. And so when Satan sees those commandments, he sees sees Jesus. When he sees the commandments, he sees the character of Jesus. When he sees the commandments, he sees the authority of Jesus. And he hates Jesus. And he would love to destroy Jesus. And that's why he gives you such a hard time. That's why he tries to get your eyes off of Christ and stomp you out. It's not about you. If he, de if he destroys you, he gets to laugh because he knows that he breaks the heart of Christ. This war isn't about us at all. It's about Christ and Satan. The role we play is get rid of self. Satan hates Jesus. When we looked in the Bible last night, and we saw very clearly in Romans 7, verse 12, where the Bible said that the commandment was holy, just, and good. And then we saw in 1 Peter 1, 16, that the Bible said that Jesus was holy. And then we saw in Revelation uh, 15, verse 3, that Jesus is just. And then we saw in Psalm 25, 8, that Jesus is good. No wonder why the devil wants people to despise and look down on God's holy law. No wonder he can't stand when they're hanging up in courtrooms and in, in school rooms and out in, on marble on public, state, or federal facilities. He hates the commandments of God because the commandments of God are a perfect reflection reflection of Jesus Christ himself. Why do you think it is that he doesn't like you to study the Bible? Because he knows that within these pages is described in perfect, in perfect literature, the character of Jesus himself. And so he always wants to diminish the role of Christ, and we allow him to. Too often, we let him do it. Christ wants desperately to give us something. That's his Holy Spirit. That's his gift to us. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Turn with me to John chapter 17 where we see the Lord's Prayer. John, what chapter are we going to? 17, where we see the Lord's Prayer. Now God gave us a prayer to pray, a prayer to pray, and we have named it the Lord's Prayer. But the Lord didn't pray that for himself. He gave us the model prayer for us. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the prayer that he told the disciples they should pray when they came and said, tell us, teach us how to pray, Lord. He said, okay, when you pray, first of all, identify with me. Don't say my Father. No, 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 no. Say our Father. Because once you say our, it's conclusive of somebody else and that somebody is me. Say, our Father, and I'm not talking about this earthly guy, which art in heaven, holy is your name. You're holy, God, and I approach you with reverence and respect. I don't look up to heaven and say, Daddy, I just want you to love me. People have caused God to be so common, it's an offense in the sight of God. Jesus said, our Father, we should call him, who art in heaven. He said, hallowed be the holy is your name. And then you have to be careful. Because if you pray that prayer in sincerity, you must be in Christ. Because immediately you shift and you say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now you're talking about perfection now. How can a human have the perfect will of Christ performed in his life without having perfection or victory? Therefore, what you're saying, once you say our Father, you're admitting even then. When you say our Father, you're saying that I am in Christ. Because the only way you can say our Father is to be in Christ. And the Bible says in Him is no sin. So if I'm in Christ, my sins are covered. They're here. They're, 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 they're hid. And so when I say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, I can talk to Him now because I'm in Christ. I have, I have connected myself to heaven with Christ. And when I say thy will be done, Perfect the way it's done in heaven. Whatever God commands in heaven, it's perfectly done. 
All through the Bible, especially I remember in Ezekiel 9, when the angel goes and sets the mark on the foreheads of the individuals who he is told that are crying and sighing for the abominations that be done in the world. Seal the people, he says. And when the angel gets through, the angel goes back and says, I have done as you have commanded me to do. Thy will has been perfectly done. And so when we're in Christ, his power now allows us to perfectly reproduce his will. So now we could say, thy will be done. As it is in heaven, I'll do it now on earth. Not by might, not by my own strength, but by the power of the Holy Ghost. I can do it. Man can't do it. It's an impossibility. But now that I have identified with heaven, now that I've accepted the adoption that came through the blood of Jesus Christ, now that I've accepted the propitiation through his blood, I have a new lineage, and now I can do whatever he does. Why? Because I am a joint heir of Christ. And then we start praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we say, give us this day. I can't eat for tomorrow. What happened yesterday is irrelevant, but give us this day our daily bread. I'm not talking about asking for food to eat. I'm not talking about some fried chicken or some banana bread or some, some barbecue tofu. No, God says it's an insult to even ask him to provide food. For you to get on your knees and say, oh, Lord, please provide food, that's an insult to God. Jesus said, when you're in Christ, the Bible says, my God shall supply all your need. Is that true? Is that what it says? Is daily food, physical food a need? Then why do you have to ask? All you have to do is thank him for it. The food's coming. You're not going to go hungry with God. You see, we insult God. So, oh, God, please, the winter's coming, and it's getting cold in my heat. If it's a need, my God shall. So you need to ask for other things. Spend your time praying on other issues. So give us this day our spiritual need, our spiritual food. Open my mind so that I can understand your perfect will on earth. And only through the word, through that bread, will I understand his will. He doesn't just say, okay, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And now he says, okay, now where's the will? No, 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 no. Now you have to open the word because his will is found right here. Amen. His will's found right here. And then he says, uh, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And that's where the average person leaves Jesus right there. Because we say, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. And then it says this, as we. As we. Now, who in this room is lost tonight? Because they haven't forgiven somebody. Who in this room is holding a grudge? Because they don't love people the way Jesus loves them. He says, forgive as we. In other words, watch me, Lord. I know you're my example in all things. But now you told me to pray and to look at my example. So Christ looks at you and he says, have you forgiven that person who hurt your child? Have you forgiven your husband? Have you forgiven your wife? Have you forgiven those parents that didn't raise you right, that mistreated you? Have you forgiven the man that raped you? Have mercy. It goes deep now. And the Holy Spirit starts going deeper. Are you envious of people? Are you jealous? Is it real, pure? You see, when you say forgive us of our debts as we forgive, what you're really saying is, Lord, what I want from you and what I desire from you, I desire for everybody else. Because if you really want people to experience the forgiveness that you experience, the forgiveness that you desire is a forgiveness that gets you in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. When you pray for forgiveness, it's with the hopes that one day you will enjoy eternal life with your Savior. And so the devil traps you right here because you don't really will and wish for others what you will and wish for yourself. You don't want them to have the same type of house. You don't want them to have the same type of car. If they get something as nice as you, sometimes you get mad about it. You don't want to see other people 
especially if it's somebody who you, your flesh, has developed a demonic oneness to hate and dislike. You can't hate and dislike people without the help of Satan. So it's a demonic oneness. It's a satanic oneness. And now there's a vicious seed in you. And the devil will lay dormant. You know, this is why you have to examine yourself in prayer. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit's trying to get us ready for the outpouring of his spirit. We pray for the spirit, we must get ready for it. Because if the spirit comes and you're unprepared, that means you are now seared. Seared, not sealed. Seared. When the Holy Spirit comes in the measure and likeness and desire that Christ wants him to come and you keep playing games, you end up being seared. That means your mind is now zip locked together. And nothing can get in and nothing can get out. Whatever's in there must stay in there. And now the Bible says that you are classified as the filthy and you're classified as the filthy still. The devil will hold those hateful thoughts in you that came, came way back when you were in elementary school. Something that happened in junior high school. God said, examine yourself to see whether you are of the faith, whether you are righteous. And what happens, the devil backs up and he doesn't allow you to see those things. And brothers and sisters, in your heart, there's harbored unforgiveness. And Christ tries to bring it to your mind, but you try to wipe it out. You try to justify it. You try to overlook it. You even lie to yourself and say, well, I, I don't, I love them, but I don't like them. No such thing. It doesn't mean you have to position yourself to repeat things, but it means the same forgiveness that Christ has for you. Have mercy. Our Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray right now for you to show us. Show us the unclean spirits that are hiding. Show us, Lord, where we have not forgiven people, where we're still hanging on to hatred as though it is a characteristic of God. Please, pour out your presence. Show us ourselves. Now help us, Lord. Help us to cast these things at your feet. Please, dear Jesus, we're lost if we don't do it. Please help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, brothers and sisters, this wasn't any Lord's prayer. This was the prayer he gave for us. This was his gift to us. His prayer is in John 17. That's when he prayed. And I want to show you in John 17, I want to show you, I want to begin and use it, his prayer as a springboard, as a rite to passage into the strange mathematics of God. Notice what it says here in John 17. These words spake Jesus. And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father. Now notice, he didn't say our Father, did he? He said Father. Why? Because he doesn't have to identify with us. We have to identify with him. Okay? Father. He lifted up his eyes and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. 
For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be what? One as we are. Have mercy. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Christ prayed that you would not only have the earthly joy, but his joy. How can we be depressed and upset? That's demonic. You think that the prayers of Christ were answered? You think his father heard him this day? Listen to what it goes on to say. This is beautiful. It says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And he goes on praying. But one of the things that we see clearly here is that even though he is one with God, and even though he is actually God, he shows that he is separate from God. Look, look at verse 5 again. Notice what it says in verse 5. It says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He's talking about two different beings, but each one is God. It even gets clearer. Go with me to the book of Mark, chapter 16. Back up to Mark 16. They were both God. Jesus, God. Father, God. Holy Ghost, God. But the three were separate. Listen to what it says here in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, let me hear you say amen. Jesus was God. The Father's God. But they were separate. Listen to what it says here in verse 19. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says in verse 19 of Mark. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. And sat what? On the right hand of who? Of God. Now how can you be received up somewhere and sit next to yourself? He sat on the right hand of God. This is your right over here. Which means they had to be separate. Notice what John 16 says. Go with me to the book of John, chapter 16. The Bible says, let, uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So let's look from the word out of the witnesses that this must be established. Notice what it says here in John, chapter 16. In John 16, and when you get there, let me hear you say amen. You see, brothers and sisters, Satan hates Jesus. Notice what it says here. In John 16, beginning with verse 26. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says in John 16, I'm in the wrong verse. John 16, beginning with verse 26. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I, and, and, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me. And ye have believed that I came out what? From who? The Father. I came out from God. So they're separate from to come out. Notice what verse 7 says. Notice what verse 7 says of John chapter 16. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen again. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. 
For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of what? And of judgment. And now notice now, first we saw a separation from the Father and the Son. Now Jesus shows that there's a separation from him and the Comforter or him and the Holy Spirit. Because he says, if I leave, the comforter will come. If I don't go, the comforter cannot come. Why did Jesus have to leave for the Holy Ghost to come? Because if Jesus did not leave, and guess what? He could have stayed. He never sinned. But if Jesus did not leave, then who would have interceded for us? See, they, they didn't understand the role that Jesus would play for them. They didn't quite understand what he would do for them. And so he said, listen, if I go, the Holy Ghost will come. But if I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come. Man needs a mediator. Notice what the Bible says. He shows very clearly. The Bible says very clearly in Matthew chapter 4, I mean John chapter 14, it shows who this comforter is. Heavenly Father, we beg you to remove every unclean spirit. Give everyone in this room a sound mind to hear and understand the things of God from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Notice what the Bible says in John 14, verse 26. John 14, verse 26. It shows that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are separate. Notice what it says here in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is who? Which is who? The Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So if the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit and Jesus says, I have to leave for him to come, then that means the Father and the Holy Spirit are separate also. And we need to be careful because a lot of times people accidentally call the Holy Spirit it. The Bible calls him he. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. The Holy Spirit cries real tears when we reject him. If you don't believe it, you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto redemption. To grieve means to be made sorrowful. He's a person. You can break his heart. And Jesus said, I will send this compassionate power. I will send the third person of the Godhead. But if I send him, I must go. Jesus is separate. Not only that, notice the prayer of David in Psalm 51. What a powerful prayer here we find in Psalm 51, the 51st division of Psalm. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is indeed a person, and he's separate from him. Listen to what it says in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And when you get there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says in the 51st division of Psalm, beginning with verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. And then notice what he says. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He was talking to the Father. He said, renew a right spirit or a constant spirit. In other words, what he was saying is, when you blot out my sins and you renew me, let me constantly walk by the direction and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. And David cried for it. There was a separateness. Look at John again with me. Go to John with me. I just want to make this clear. This is why, brothers and sisters, this is why we cannot lose. 
This is why there's no reason for, 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 for failure. Because Jesus made it, brothers and sisters, where it is impossible. Notice what it says in John, in John 15, verse 26. And when you get there, let me hear you say amen. Father, I thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And I thank you in the name of Jesus for the Holy Spirit. As we begin to close and even make better sense of this message, we pray more for the action of the Holy Spirit in this room. Please help us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, let me stop and say what the Holy Spirit wanted to say. You see why our influence is so important? You see why it is that we cannot carry ourselves the way the world carries themselves? You see why it is that when people are lashing out around you, you cannot lash back at them? When everybody else is participating in things on the job, you shouldn't have an air of righteousness, but there should be an air of happiness and humility. And when they look at you, they see a joy on you, but you're not participating in the false joy that they're engaged in. And when everybody else is going for a luncheon and everybody else is ordering drinks and you order orange juice or you order apple juice or you order cranberry juice and, and, and you don't look at them with condemnation because you understand that by beholding they'll become changed. That as they observe you and the awe around you, remember the atmosphere around you, the angels that are with you will start influencing them. And some of those same people you will one day meet on the sea of glass standing in a perfect square. You will look up and see co-workers who are saved. And Jesus will show you that their salvation was traced back to you having his spirit in that luncheon. We don't understand the power of influence. Jesus is looking desperately for somebody who will really surrender to him because he must win the loss, and he has to win them with us. That's why he said, hey, you're my hands, you're my feet. Will you bear the ark? Will you carry me from place to place? For if you don't carry me, I fall. I have to lay here and wait and watch hopelessly. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they're counting on everybody in this room. Tonight they're counting on us. Listen to what it says here. I'm talking about the separateness of the Holy Spirit and the Father. The separateness. The Bible says in John 15, 26, but when the Comforter has come. Who is the Comforter, brothers and sisters? The Holy Ghost. But when the Holy Ghost is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of who? Jesus. The whole picture, the whole war is about the love of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's never going to lift you. He's never going to make you feel important. He's never going to let you feel like you've been mistreated. He's never going to allow you to feel as though life is throwing a curve at you that is unfair. No, the Holy Spirit will always lift Jesus. When things seem so tough that you can't handle it, the Holy Spirit will point you to the cross. And you'll look up and say, I'm upset because I got fired from a job. And here Jesus is hanging on the cross Bleeding with excruciating pain. The Holy Spirit will always testify of Jesus. He will give you Christ's testimony to show you that you can do it, that you can make it, and that this was done so that you might have life. The Holy Spirit, he's not competitive. He's not jealous of Jesus. He's because he's not the one that gets all the glory. No, 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 no. If the Savior gets the glory, if Jesus gets it, the Holy Spirit is equally satisfied because the three are one. The three are one. As a matter of fact, if you go to 1 John, it says it very clear. Go with me to 1 John. Back by the book of Revelation, 1 John chapter 5. How can we lose in this world when we have three in one? helping us you have the father you have the son and you have the holy ghost 
you have an advantage on Jesus. You have an advantage on Christ himself. For you have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Ghost. Jesus had God the Father on his side, and he had God the Holy Ghost on his side, but God the Son never was activated in his life. In other words, he had it rougher than any of us could ever imagine. Because Jesus was indeed 100% God. And 100% man. There was no 50-50. Jesus chose to suppress his divinity. His divinity told the Father and the Holy Ghost, I will not duplicate or use any of my power for 33 and a half years. Literally, we put God, the Son, on hold. All he did is moved in and out and about with Christ, but never did he activate any of his authority. For 33 and a half years, God the Son simply lived in a human body without ever using any of his authority. All the power and authority that Jesus had came from God the Father. All of it. Every miracle he did, he surrendered, and the Father's power flowed through him to do the miracle. When we do miracles, we surrender, and the power flows through us for the miracle to be done. I have literally had the privilege of touching ears. I remember a young girl. This young girl worked with me. She had had surgeries on her ears, tubes put in her, in, in her ears, and, 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 and her ears would still just break out, and out of nowhere, she'd have excruciating pain, and they would become stuffed up and clogged, and she'd have to be rushed to the hospital. And I'll never forget, one day we had been praying, and she got up, and she said, oh, she was crying, it's hurting. And, and I looked, and I said, now, now we have anointed her. We prayed, and I said, Lord, okay, take her to the emergency room. And the Spirit of God said to me, no, lay your hand on her ear and pray right now. I said, okay. You know, just walked up in obedience, and I just touched her and said, said Father, heal her ears. And I turned around to walk, and she said, oh! And I looked back at her, like, what happened? She said, oh, I said, what's wrong? She said, it's popping. What? My ear's popping. You know how your ear pops when it stops? How when you yawn, it pops. He said, oh, it's popping. He said, whew, it's gone. It's gone. Her ear was completely healed. You cannot, there's no trace of a form of surgery. Now, did I do that? No. If I was able to do it, I'd put medical doctors out of business. I'd have lines waiting for in the morning. And I'd have Blue Shield and Blue Cross and all these other insurance companies sending me checks. Every day as they come in, I, I do a certain amount of day, and then I go on vacation. Every time I need some money, no. But the power of God flowed through me. And the exact same way the power of the Holy Spirit would come through me and exercise that power, he would come through Jesus' manhood and exercise that power. Never did Christ ever get to use what we get to use, and that's God the Son. Now, how can we fail? He defeated Satan without ever using the second person of the Godhead's power. He defeated him by surrendering to the Father. He said, Father, you, 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 you just read his prayer. His whole prayer was about Father. It, it, it's about you. Father, I surrender to you. I come not to do my will, but him that sent me. Because my will is a fleshly will. My will is the will of a man. In other words, I will get upset. I will get angry. I will lust. I will covet. I will steal, so I cannot trust anything about the will of this man. I must trust only the will of my Father because I know that his will is a perfect will. And this is what God did. God literally, God the Son, 
went on hold. But this, this is the thing. Now you think about it. You think about it. God the Son went on hold. Now you think about this a minute. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, anyone could any time speak and anything they say would be done. Before the word comes out, Psalm 33, look at it with me a moment, brothers and sisters. Follow me with these scriptures. We'll come right back to 1 John 5. Go with me to Psalm 33, the 33rd division of Psalm. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. But Lord, we want more. Please, tonight, May the power and authority of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost show up in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 33. The Bible says in Psalm 33, beginning with verse 6, if you're there, let me hear you say amen. You need to understand, I need to understand what has been sacrificed and what was done for us. Notice what it says here. Psalm 33, beginning with verse 6. Notice what it says. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by what? The breath of his mouth. In other words, the word could not come out. The minute his mind thought it and it, and it got in his mouth, it was there. It was, it was a wrap. No, notice, let's drop down. Notice what it says in verse 9. Listen to what it says. For he spake... And it was. It didn't happen after he spake. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. See, man's word is limited. Man, when he speaks, he has to act upon his word to fulfill what he speaks. I don't care how powerful he is. Let that man die. Somebody else has to act now and kill the man. You can have all the riches. Somebody has to act to deliver the riches. But Jesus, oh, no, uh-uh, no. He spake, and there it was. You hear the word, and you don't know whether you heard it or saw it first. If you blinked, it was there. You saw it as you heard it, but you shouldn't have blinked. That's the power. Now, wait a minute. This type of power agreed in heaven to become a man, 100% man. Four square, all man, no deviation, so that we could be saved. He said, I will only use what is in the power and the hands of a human to use. In other words, if you can't do it, then he wouldn't do it. That's why when he was hungry and he could have turned the stone into bread, he never did it. If thou be the Son of God, what he was really doing is trying to wake up his divinity. If thou be the Son God, if you are the Son God, if you are God, the second person, prove it, prove it, look at you. He was trying to disorient it. all the angels who had watched the God Son that they knew become the human, but he couldn't do it. Jesus said, I won't do it because there'll be times when I will back up and allow my children to be hungry and they'll trust me anyway. And they'll have to wait for me to provide for them through a natural means. And I'm not going to do it because I want them. I know they don't have the power to just do that. So the God, the second person of the Godhead, never activated itself. But in the agreement that he made with his Father, in the agreement that he made with the Holy Ghost. Now, brothers and sisters, this was before the world was created. See, the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. When Satan first sinned. When Satan first rebelled in heaven, Jesus had already committed to dying for man before Satan ever sinned. And when Satan sinned in the face of God, Jesus stepped in and shielded him from being destroyed. It was a proleptic sacrifice. In other words, a proleptic sacrifice is, uh, is, is like credit. You agree to pay something before it takes place. Remember what Jesus said when, he, when the Good Samaritan took the man to the hospital? He said, look, I'm going to leave, and any bills that he may incur, I'll come and pay it. Well, Jesus said, I will die for sin. I will die for creation. I will die if they sin. 
And then the world went as though nothing happened. And we don't know how long they lived. But the minute the devil rebelled, Jesus stepped in between and said, here's my credit card. Boom, I'm going to pay it. And when Adam bit that fruit, Jesus didn't start thinking of what to do. Immediately, he promised, I'm going to put enmity in your heart. And he promised him that before he started telling him anything else. Before he put him out the garden, he said, I'm going to give you the ability to hate sin. And you know what? I'm going to crush sin. And I'm coming through a woman. E, I'm coming through a woman. That's what Jesus did for us. But wait a minute. See, all that sounds like, wow. God, the Son, could never be activated. His power and authority could never be seen. But he said, if, have mercy. You, you won't even understand this. He said, if. Jesus, in his humanity, if he commits one sin, I will not only humble myself not to be used or activated for these years while he's on earth, but God the Son, God the Creator, would subject his authority and give all of his power to the dominion of Satan and live forever under his rule. Now, none of you have ever heard this preached before in your life. Do you understand what God has done for us? God said, even though I have no role to play in it, God the Son said, even though I don't get to move a finger, if this human cannot stay surrendered to the Father, if he steps out and allows his flesh to act up one time, I will take my divinity and subject it to Satan throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I will be his slave. Now, you're talking about equal power to the Father. Jesus has equal power with the Father. He has equal power with the Holy Ghost. And now, if Christ in his humanity, do you understand what was on the table? Did you ever think about what was really about to take place where Satan would have had access to? You think Bush is scared of Iran having a nuclear weapon? Why? Because if they have a nuclear weapon, now the playing field is fair. You can't bully them around because they could push a button and they could destroy like you could destroy. Satan would have had equal power to the Father and the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine what he would have done with it? Can you imagine how he would have abused it Satan could have manipulated and dogged out any angelic being that didn't fall. He could have disrupted the harmony in any of the other worlds because he would have had the power of the God Son subjected to him. And Jesus said, man can keep God's law if he would just surrender to me. If you will surrender to me, he said, you can keep my law. If you would surrender to me, you can obey my commands. If you would surrender to me, why? Because I have kept my father's commands. Nothing's in me. Nothing that the devil can get to me on. He surrendered himself fully. The devil understood the stakes. This is why when Jesus was born, Satan backed off every other demon and said, I'll handle this one. They said, right now, yep, the rest of them, no, 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 this one's mine. This is why he killed all the babies in Moses' day. He wanted desperately. He thought Abel was Jesus for a minute. He saw how faithfully Abel was serving God. He said, man, maybe I slipped, and he would go through the books of records, how he had chronicled the life of Abel. And after I said, well, maybe he didn't do this. He started second-guessing his own record and said, you know what, let me get Cain to kill him. Looks too much like Jesus. Kill him. Jesus. 
put everything. When he says he gave his all, he gave his all. He didn't hold back like some of you hold back. He didn't play with it. He gave everything, not considering himself. When he subjected himself to manliness, to humanity, brothers and sisters, the whole second person of the Godhead, the whole universe, even God the Father himself was at stake because another authority equal to his own would have had the right to immortality, the right to creating. After the devil wiped out whatever he wanted to wipe out, he could have looked at God the Son and said, create me another world. Do you understand that? And he lived flawlessly. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 1 John 5, O oh God of heaven, I thank you for the Holy Ghost, and I plead for more as we close. Pour out your spirit in Jesus' name. Notice what the Bible says. I'm coming back to that statement. Do you understand what's on the line now? What's on the line now is your ability to live with this type of God forever or your ability to die with that devil. You have the right to live or to die. Christ put everything on the line. Do you understand a little better now what it means for the Father to allow the Son to come? Do you understand? Some of you would never give someone else the equal strength to fight you. Never. You would never offer somebody equal power if you lose. You hold something back, but God held nothing back. Nothing. Now why on earth would you hang on to something that's surely going to be destroyed? Why would you do it? Why? In closing, the Bible says, in verse 7 of 1 John, for there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Clearly, these three are one. They're the same in power. They're one in purpose. They're one in design. They're one in plans. These three are one. Yes, Jesus is sat on the right hand of his father yes Jesus is separate from his father but he's God yes the Holy Ghost could not come unless Jesus left which means they're separate the father sent him which means they're separate but they're still one these three are one the father the word and the Holy Ghost John verse 1 John chapter 1 St. John chapter 1 says very clearly to clear up any question in our minds. The Bible said that there are three that bear record in heaven. Three. That's why the Bible says, and you're going to St. John chapter 1, that's why the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. There are three that bear witness in heaven. God the Father cannot lie. When he looked at the life of his son, he saw that there was no deviation from strict integrity. Therefore, he met God's approval. When the Holy Ghost reviewed it, it was clear. And God the Son would have honestly told the truth had Jesus in his humanity sinned. He would not have changed anything. He would have said, no, as I bear record, his humanity failed. If there could not be a world built on love and honesty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost said that it wasn't worth there even being a world. If there would not be a place where we could go where the only law is the law of love, then it's not worth even having a place. I don't want robots. I can imagine how God must feel 
You know, I tell my children all the time. I say, listen, you've got to have your personal experience with God and you must know Him for yourself and you must develop your own experience and you must ask God what your will is. Why? I said, because many people smile at you because you're my child. And if something happened to me, they wouldn't love you. Who wants friends that are just around because you can do something for them? I tell my son, I say, son, some people will actually try to hurt you because you're my son. And these are people who are claimed to like me. I tell my children, there are leaders that will get together behind your back and talk about you. They'll despise you. They'll be jealous. These are the spirits of Satan. I said, don't ever think that every grin with white teeth, no matter how friendly it may be, is really on your side. I said, only Jesus is on your side. Now, how does Jesus feel? when people hang around the church just for what they could get. He didn't want a whole universe. Think about it. Where people would just serve him because he could give them a world. No. Mm -mm. He said, I want people that are going to live forever. Forever. I want them to live forever and love me, not be jealous of each other, know that everybody has access. You see, once we have rights to passage to the throne of God, then guess what? Nobody's richer than anybody else. Because brothers and sisters, Satan used to seal up the sum. He doesn't seal up the sum anymore. See, everything that he forfeited, we can have and more. God says, listen, you don't understand what I have for you. You don't understand, but you have to love me. Yes, I use heaven. You know, God talks about the new heavens and the new earth, and he talks about the tree and the crystal pure water, and, and he does all this because he tries to reach us in our humanity so he can get the humanity to the divinity. But if you're scared of hellfire or you desire some mansion, no. He's trying to get you to love his son. If you love his son and you're willing to do anything for his son, then you can go to heaven. But if you're a robot, he could have easily, once the devil messed up, it snapped and every angel followed him. Don't disagree. Every we, up, and, he, and, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost could have sat back and looked at each other as they had a whole multitude, vast multitude of robots. No. Uh-uh. No, brothers and sisters. He said, if it takes me having to give equal power to the devil, I know that it is possible for a man to surrender to my love. The only reason why Jesus obeyed his Father moment after moment, second after second, minute after minute, hour after hour is because he loved him. That's it. He wasn't motivated by getting back to heaven. He was motivated for his love to his Father and his commitment to us. <laughs> and so that's why he says this. This is what he was motivated by. Listen to what he says in the beginning. Now remember, the Bible says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So here the Bible says in verse 1 of, of, of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, and the Word, are you there? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth this was talking about jesus verse 11 says he came to his own in other words jesus made a public appearance he came to his own and his own received him not he said he was made flesh the word made means married Two. In other words, he married humanity. Follow me now. He married humanity. He said, I'm with it. If the rest of them cannot live forever, then I don't want to live forever. If the rest of them can't serve you, if the stakes of love are that high, if I've created and I'm wrong because I just want people to love me for me. 
I want them to serve me because of my love for them. No other alternative. If I'm wrong for wanting that, then let me pay for my own mistake in desiring that, and I'll be subject to the powers of darkness. The Bible says very clearly in Ephesians 3, Turn with me to Ephesians 3. I'm closing now. I want to show you two more texts. Ephesians 3. Notice what the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 3. Father, thank you. We cannot fully comprehend what you have done for us tonight. We can't comprehend. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm, I'm, I'm through. God has said enough for us, brothers and sisters. It's decision time. It's decision time. God was willing to give up everything. He put it all on the line for you. That's why he hates pride so much. Instead of all the sins, pride and self-sufficiency are the most incurable. That's what he said. He hates pride. Why? Because he was not too proud to take on the form of a man. He was not too proud to give up all of heaven. He was not too proud to be born around some stinky animals. He gave it all up for you. Tonight. He says, all I want you to give up is your heart. My son, my daughter. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. There are some people who claim to give God their heart. They haven't given God their heart. That's why it's a struggle when God wants money. Because their heart's not with him, so their money's not with them. And they'll splurge on everything else, but when it comes to God, haven't given God their heart. That's why they won't forgive somebody that has wronged them. They won't just humble themselves and say, it's me. Forgive me, Lord, and forgive them. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And if you ever want to be saved, you have to give it to Jesus. He says, my son, my daughter, give me your heart so that I can give you a new heart, a heart that will love you, a heart that won't be so proud, a heart that won't be arrogant, a heart that won't seek it its own, a heart that will care more for others than for themselves. Give me your heart. Tonight, God has never, ever asked you to even begin to try to do what Christ has done, he just says to you, give me your heart and I will apply everything that he has done to your record. Everything that he has done to your record. And I will give you power. 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 To live in perfect obedience by the Holy Spirit dwelling in your life. Now I want to make an appeal. Do you want to give Jesus your heart tonight? Don't say yes and then not forgive somebody. Forgive as I forgive. Do you want to give Jesus your heart tonight? Don't say yes and have plots and plans that are contrary to the will and the ways of God. If you love me, keep my commands. Give me 
Lord, why do you want my heart? Because I want to give you. I want to give you back the Garden of Eden. I want to give you back a world. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to enjoy the fellowship of my children without any barriers or walls. I want to look at you face to face. I'm tired of seeing you suffer. I hate to see how your body is aging and dying even now. doesn't matter how young you are, you're dying, and it breaks my heart. Give me your heart. I want to restore you tonight. Will you give your heart to God right now? Will you accept what Christ has done for you? Or will you keep playing games? If God is your desire tonight, if you want God to accept you, you need to make a covenant. If you have made pledges to God in the past and you just forgot them, you better remind God, like ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of those pledges and you, ne you need to start fulfilling them. Don't make vows, the Bible says, that you don't keep. Just because your situation changes? No, 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 no. If you told God you're going to do something, you need to do it. You told him you're going to pray at a certain time, you need to pray. He will give you the power. His biddings are enablings. He'll never expect you to do it on your own. If you promise God certain financial covenants, you go to God and say, I'm sorry, Lord. Now help me. And as I get on, I'm, if I have to give you a penny by penny, if you told God that you would forgive somebody, you better forgive them. If you told God you can have my heart and do what you want with it, then tonight, don't take it back. Do you want to make that covenant with God tonight? Do you want to accept his sacrifice? Do you want his, his son's blood to blot out your transgressions? To give you a constant, consistent spirit? Is that your desire? It's for the asking. If you're serious about it, if that's your prayer, I invite you to stand wherever you are right now. This is serious business. And as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to say this for those who may not choose to stand. There's no other way to go but with God. Don't ever think that your standing gives you the power to do what God wants you to do. Your standing gives him the power to do what he wants to do in your life. Your standing gives him the power to change you. Gives him the authority to change your life. Your standing does not change anything. It just gives him the right to make the changes. I stood on the side of God so that he could change me. The biggest lie the devil tells is I'm going to wait till I get right. You will never get right. Tonight, I offer you the only solution. Tonight, I offer you the only way to salvation. Tonight, I offer you Jesus. Will you stand and accept him? Before I pray, is it anyone else who wants to say, Lord, I stand. Please, help me, Lord. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I call upon you tonight like I've never called upon you before. Because my heart has become hardened. And I need you to soften it. My heart, Lord. I don't want to play with you. I give you that hard heart. I pray now for my brothers and sisters who may not see themselves as clear as you see them. I pray that you would show them very clearly the destructive power of their influence and what it has been. Don't let anything hide. And grant them access to a new heart and a new mind as we surrender tonight. Thank you for forgiveness. 
thank you for renewal and cleansing. And now, Holy Father, keep us. Answer the prayer of your Son. Keep us. Keep us from the taint and the influence of the powers of darkness. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated?